this winter at Acme is your chance to experience a remarkable array of works from Tate's collection. Connected by the theme of light and spanning over 200 years, see incredible works from Turner, Kusama, Monet, Tourelle and many more. From one of the UK's most adored cultural institutions, see art in a new light. Light works from Tate's collection. Now open. Great. Uh, I think we are live. Hi, everyone. Um, first off, I'd like to acknowledge that today we are meeting on the unceded lands of the Wawandri and Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nations. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, uh, and to any First Nations people in the audience or watching online. I know we're also broadcasting um, the session, as just mentioned, uh, to viewers scattered across Victoria, maybe even other states, other continents. Um, so I think it's especially appropriate in this session to reflect on how understandings of space and sovereignty are constructed in 2022, uh, given that some of the games we're gonna talk about today are inspired by Australian landscapes. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm Douglas Wilson. I'm a senior lecturer at RMIT University's Bachelor of Games uh, program, uh, and also co-owner of Danish games studio Die Gute Fabrik. Uh, just to recap, if you're joining us for the first time here, um, RMIT Games has been co-hosting this talk series uh, with our friends at Acme. Um, this is sadly the final session of the 2022 series, um, but you can find all the episodes uh, recorded and archived on Acme's YouTube channel. Um, and if you want to listen um, to some more really excellent Australian developers, uh, go, go check those out. Um, big thanks um, to the Acme staff for hosting this and running the infrastructure to get this up online. Um, by the way, uh, towards the end of the session, we'll be taking some questions, for, I think primarily from the live audience here at Acme, um, and we'll, we'll probably pass the mic around um, when that happens. All right, so let's get to our guest. Um, today, I am very pleased to welcome Ian McClarty. Uh, quick little background on Ian. Ian is a video game developer living in Melbourne with an interest in experimental design. He's released over 40 small non-commercial works, but also has self-published several award-winning commercial games. Um, we're gonna talk about both of those today. Uh, he has a background in computer science and often uses self-made tools and generative techniques. Uh, he is also one of my personal favorite um, game developers, so I'm honored to be here interviewing him. Hello, Ian. What? Okay, cool. Thank <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, to kick off the interview, um, I know probably some people in the audience are really familiar with your work, maybe others less so, or especially people tuning in online. Um, so let's, let's just start off by just, just showing a little bit of um, your recent work uh, to provide a, a more tangible sense of the kind of games that you make. So let's show a short video trailer for your most recent forthcoming project, uh, Mars First Logistics. So here's just a little couple of minutes, um, and Ian, you're going to hear Ian's voice explaining what this is. Hi, my name's Ian, and I'm the creator of Mars First Logistics an open-world physics sim about building rovers and piloting them across the surface of Mars, which I'm making with a small team. In this video, I'll try and give you a sense of what to expect from our game. In Mars First Logistics, it's your job to help grow a burgeoning space colony by transporting cargo between stations using vehicles you build yourself. Let's jump in and do a delivery and I'll talk you through it. We can see our available contracts from the map. This one is close by. So let's accept it. Now we just have to follow the marker to collect our cargo. Our current rover isn't really built to carry this steel beam, so we'll need to design something new. This is the editor, where you'll probably spend a lot of time building and refining your designs. Here I'm using a servo motor to create an arm and a hydraulic cylinder to create a grabber. I need a few more connector parts, so I'll spend some funds to buy them. Sometimes you might not be able to afford all the parts you need. 
and we'll have to get creative with what you have on hand. Let's give our new vehicle a quick paint job to finish it off. Now is a good time to explain how the controls work. I've got two things I can control on this vehicle. The servo motor and the hydraulic cylinder. They're both controlled with the same buttons, but are assigned to different channels, which lets me control them independently, simply by switching channels. Much like switching weapons on a shooter. This drive is fairly short and flat, but the landscape can be challenging. It's always a good idea to plan your route beforehand. And here we are at the destination. We just need to place the cargo in the delivery zone to finish. As you help the colonists finish their construction projects, you'll be rewarded with new parts and blueprints. There are a number of construction projects to complete in the game. I hope that's given you an idea of how the game plays. Thanks for watching, and please give it a wish list on Steam if it looks appealing. Great. Um, Ian, just for some context, uh, how long have you been working on Mars First Logistics, uh, and how long do you plan to keep working on it? Um, so I started working on it um, at the end of 2020, um, but I've been working on other projects, so on and off about a year full time, I think. And I don't know how long I'm going to continue working on it for. Um, I'm planning to release it next year, but I, I don't know. Exactly. I see. Well. You might release it, but then kind of keep updating it. Potentially, right? yeah. 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 Um, so lots of questions about Mars First Logistics. Um, we'll definitely dive into that. But first, to kind of set up this game, kind of like, and also understand where it's coming from in terms of Ian's work, um, I want to rewind and look at some of your prior work uh, leading up to it. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about your work is how prolific you are. We mentioned in the bio, kind of over you know, these 40 kind of non-commercial games. Uh, and there's, of course, there's no way we'll have time to cover all your games in this session. But I wanted to focus on just a couple of examples from some years ago that I think highlight the breadth of your work. So um, to start, uh, I want to talk about your 2016 game, um, Catacombs of Solaris, one of my all-time favorite art games. Uh, I'm going to show a video of it um, right now. But I, I just wanted to warn the audience that the footage is going to contain some brash moving colors and some kind of disorienting motion. So just, just a heads up. Um, while the video plays in a moment behind us without sound, um, Ian, as, as we kind of look at this, can you explain in your own words what this game is? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's you're in a maze um, and you're walking around the maze. It's very colorful. Um, and then when you stop, it kind of plays a trick on you. Um, and sort of changes the space around you without you, without anything actually changing on the screen, um, and so it's very disorientating. Um, and um, as you as you play it, you can kind of it's very confusing initially, but as you play it, you can kind of understand how it works, and it, it sort of turns into almost like an art creation tool. Mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of control it and make your own images out of it, in it. So as I understand, and let's draw a screenshot, um, there's this kind of translation from sp spatial representation from 3D to 2D. Like we're looking at this virtual yeah. 3D space on a 2D screen, but the 2D image could be any kind of number. Yeah, of it plays 3D. with the fact that it's on a 2D screen mm. and it's like 3D represented on a 2D screen. People often say, oh, you need to make this game in VR. And it's like, it just wouldn't work in VR because it it depends on the fact that it's 2D. It's like um, the uh, one of the kind of like seeds of the idea was like when you watch sports and, you, and like cricket or something, and you see like they have advertising on the, on the pitch, yeah. but the advertising looks like it's like perpendicular with the camera. But when you look at it, if you're at the game and you look at it, it's all like smeared out in this weird shape on the on the on the field. Um, so it was kind of like to play with that. And of course, that only works because the TV screen is that you're watching the game on is like 2D, right? Yeah. So essentially, um, if I could phrase it this way, Catacombs of Solaris is like a software magic trick that plays this like kind of in incredible uh, visual spatial experience. 
but without any explicit goal or endpoint. Like you're not collecting anything. There's no endpoint. Well, I mean, like yeah, on. I think on the description I said the goal is to find your favorite room. Here right. In okay. <laughs> right, right. Good. Um, I, I guess I meant like systematized yeah, goal yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. Um, can you talk about like, the motive? So you talked a little bit about the inspiration there, but the motivations for making a game like Catacombs, and specifically um, when we were talking, it kind of sounds like a lot of your work is motivated by exploring technology as kind of a core goal, um, or like at least like the materiality of the software is not just kind of a means to an end, but is like maybe almost an end in itself. Is that right? Like, can you talk about that kind of motivation with like um, explorative technology? Yeah, I don't know. So like, um, it wasn't really like a, a strong like motivation for this game it kind of just like it just popped in my head and i was like oh that seems like a cool thing to make and i made it like um and i think in general like i am i am very interested in computers i wouldn't say i'm like interested in technology because that kind of sounds like i'm interested in like the latest iphone or like mm -hmm. vr or things like that but i am like um i'm interested in programming i kind of enjoy like the problem solving part of that and i just enjoy kind of tinkering with computers and making pictures appear on the screen by, you know, the sort of abstract process of writing computer code. I just find it, like, appealing. Um, so I think, like, that is, like, a, um, not necessarily a goal, but, like, a kind of a something that I like to explore. And I think that's why what appeals to me about video games as a medium. Mm -hmm. Um, and just for context, um, we'll get to the kind of re-release of this in a second, but the original Catacombs of Solaris, do you kind of remember how long that, that took you to make, roughly? Oh, it was like a week, yeah. 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 Cool. It was a few little experiments. I think like, I just sort of initially played with that idea of like, um, it wasn't like set in a catacombs, it was just like a model, and then I would sort of do the effect that it does, um, and then it kind of, the idea of it being sort of in this kind of infinite maze kind of, um, kind of evolved out of that because it was really fun to just like apply that sort of effect over and over and end up with these weird distorted mm. interesting um, patterns yeah um, so uh, also kind of curious in the kind of the context of you so this is originally comes out in 2016 and kind of like what you're working on back then. Yep. Um, you are currently working full time on Mars first logistics mm -hmm. um, but I know, Catacombs of Solaris originally comes from this like different era when you were working on games, like uh, kind of as side projects as well. Um, can you tell us about your background in software engineering and the kind of relation with some of some of your previous projects that like weren't full time? Um, yeah, so um, uh, I, I, I got like a, um, I did a degree in computer science in Johannesburg, and then I did post grad research at Melbourne Uni in like programming languages. So I'm uh, and then, and then um, I think one of my colleagues was actually like worked on Allegro, which is a, a, a sort of a game engine, um, sort of like a, a game making library, just any, any spare time, like open source project. And I, that sort of awakened something in me and I started making some little games and also the app store was kind of taking off then. And it was like, oh, anyone can just like make a game. So I made some games, put them in the App Store. Um, and then I made a kind of a bigger project with a friend of mine, Boast on X, and that actually ended up being a commercial success. And then I decided, I asked my, where I was working, um, if I could just go to three days a week, and they kindly said yes. So I went to three days a week. And I kind of, what I thought at the time was like, well, I'll use those two days to like, maybe make another commercial game, but I actually just ended up making a whole lot of little projects and just kind of, I think because I was in this point where I was like still getting income from the other jobs, so I didn't really have to make games to earn money, but then I had this extra time. So it was actually a really nice kind of period to just like hone my craft and kind of just make a bunch of, like have fun and experiment, yeah. And. Um, just in the current, like, so how long were you at that kind of like part time? Um, like a few years? So, yeah, it was a few, like three or four years, I think. Mm. And then, um, and then I went full time when I launched December because I thought I sort of I sort of started making December and I, that sort of felt like it was something I wanted to spend a bit more time on. There was a lot of interesting design ideas there, and I thought you know could have commercial potential. And I got a grant from 
a release gone from from fixed well film Vic at the time, fixed screen now. Um, so that gave me a bit of bit of budget. I, I uh, don't have a screenshot of that here, but that's a, so that's like a, just to summarize for the audience is a puzzle game primarily yeah. mobile focused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It also has lots of bright colors. Mm. Kind of looks like the screenshot behind us. <laughs> um, yeah, and also I think the other thing that kind of sort of led me to say, okay, I'll, I'll do full time, is that like obviously three years of like working as a programmer in various companies, I'd like, you know, sort of attained a level of sort of financial freedom that kind of allowed me to do that as well. So it wasn't like a huge big risk for me. Mm. I and mean, obviously it's like kind of scary still, but, but mm. like it's not as big a risk as, you know, if I was just doing it straight out of uni or something like mm. that. Yeah. Um, We'll get there. I have some more questions too about that kind of shift to Mars First Logistics. Um, but as you were just talking about, before you went um, full time, you balanced both um, small commercial projects. We were just talking about, um, I should have a picture here of Buzz and X, which you mentioned, um, but also these experimental and sometimes almost like anti commercial projects. I think about something like um, Video Jam, uh, which is a remix of uh, an action button entertainment commercial multiplayer game um, called Video Ball. Um, how do you view the? Rela I know this is a big question, but how do you review? Uh, how do you view the relationship between these like commercial projects and these non-commercial projects? Like, do you go into these various projects knowing what those goals are? Like, yep, this is a commercial project, or yep, this is a non-commercial project, or do those goals kind of like only develop later organically after you kind of see how the experiments turn out? Like, how instrumental are you about that kind of? I think it, it varies. Um, I think it varies. Um, like game by game, I think it's like, I think like for example, like Jump Grid was a commercial game that I made, and I, I made it. That was for initially for a game. I had this, so I kind of I'd been really interested in this like movement. Um, I mean, in Black like Boson X and like Jelly Juggle and all those games, like just those little action games, like exploring that like, especially on like a touch screen, and so I had these like prototypes lying around and then there was a game jam that someone, um, James Earl Cox uh, created, which was um, salvage jam. So the idea was that you, something that you'd like just discarded, you would like make. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll just like take one of these discarded things and sort of just, you know, make it work and then like submit that. And then even though it didn't really get like a big reception or anything, but I was just like, I just thought like, I really like this like concept and like, I just like, there's a lot to explore here. And so I decided to, okay, I'm, and, and also cause like, I was like, I'd released the same, but I was like, well, I should probably be making another commercial game. <laughs> it was like, okay, let me just do this because like, but I, yeah, and I ended up like spending a year on that and like, it didn't like, do very well commercially, but I'm really proud of that game. It like got lots of awards and stuff. Um, so, like I, I, I feel like it was time well spent. But like um, um, something like Boson X was like a partnership with a friend of mine, and so I, I think we both had the expectation that it would be a commercial game. Sometimes you just make something, and it's just like you know, I just wanted, I just have this concept like Catacombs, where it's like I just have this concept that like. I just want to put out there, um, and that's it. You know, it's like there's nothing more to explore. That's basically it. Um, and then something like like Mars vs. Logistics. It's like it started off as a as a, a commission game, and it, it just like you just feel this has a lot of like it had legs. You know, it's like oh, this can go places. So like actually, let me like run with this, and um, you know, there's there's a lot more to kind of. It like feels like it would be something that people would, you know, be interested in more broadly. But also it has like legs in terms of like, this is something I can see myself working on for a while because it's fun to work on as well. So I it's like, um, yeah, it's a combination of factors. Is that answer? <laughs> so kind of yeah. a, but I see even with Mars first logistics, you're saying it wasn't the con the, even the initial concept wasn't this kind of like calculated, ah, there's like a gap no, kind of in no, it. It was just, no, it's just uh, like, okay. I had no idea if it was even gonna work. Like mm. I thought, I thought like a physics kind of building game, I thought it's like, 
I'm probably going to like implement it. It's just going to like fall apart and not work. But it, like it was surprised me like how actually it just all kind of worked. Mm. So yeah. Um, it's interesting you were just talking about catacombs as like okay, well I'm like finished with it. It, it kind of is this thing. But I actually wanted to go back to that example um, because. Um, Last year, you released a commercial expansion of Catacombs <laughs> of Solaris on Steam. Yeah. Um, now, there's still no kind of like systematized end goal or like quote unquote traditional gameplay. Um, but you did add like a proper menu and some new graphical modes pictured here. And like you're selling it on this major commercial storefront, right? Rather than just kind of like pay what you want on itch.io. Um, and so, it, I guess this gets like to this like both directions of this like interplay between this like pile of non-commercial projects here and this pile of commercial projects here. Like, why re-release the game on Steam? You know, what is this like five years later? Um, like, like what what did you feel you had to do to to take that game to to put it on this other storefront? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So the, I think there's like quite a few factors. So like. The like so the original game was really popular and it was like shown a lot of festivals and parties and things like that, and I added like, I think just to maybe, people ask for it or maybe just to keep it fresh and there was like competitive catacombs as well, um, where, I just I added like extra sort of modes and effects and things like that just to kind of mix it up a bit, mm -hmm. um, and, and then the other thing. And so it would have been nice to kind of just take all those like sort of extra effects that I had just lying around in like various sort of party editions of the game on the hard drive and like put them into something that, you know, everyone could kind of as like consolidate them basically. Um, but then also I think because it was such a like popular game, well like well-known kind of milestone kind of for me, I felt like I wanted to put it somewhere where it was a bit more, like, I mean, it's just a really great site, right? But you are just at the end of the day going to a website downloading an EXE, right? It's like, you wouldn't normally do that. Like, I mean, you couldn't, it's like, a, you, you, I mean, like we would because like, I guess we sort of, we trust the people who make the games, you know, but like, it's sort of, it's not, it's not a site that I would expect like, you know, anyone to just go to and just download an XE and put it on the computer. It's like, it's not really a sensible thing to do, to be honest. <laughs> like, um, and so I think sort of having it on like just a site that's a bit more like um, trusted by the mainstream in the sense of like, if I download something from this site, you know, Steam, it's not going to like break my computer, you know, or put a virus on or something. So it's just like, it just makes it more accessible, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, and then, you know, like putting a menu in it so it just, you can like see the controls or whatever, it just makes it a bit more accessible. Like each, you know, I just put the controls, like what you actually do in the actual game description. Um, so I think it was just about sort of like consolidating it and just sort of making it into something that's a bit more accessible kind of mm. um, to like people who wouldn't necessarily know about or download things from each. I see, so it's not even, and like that's maybe partly what interests me here. It's not even necessarily this like commercial enterprise. Like I'm hoping no, to I get. No, I mean I wasn't expecting to make mm. a lot of money from it. No, like. Um, um, so it's like storefront as distribution or visibility more than it is necessarily like direct. Yeah, cash yeah, yeah, yeah. And it only took me like a couple of weeks to put it all together because mm. I had all the bits and pieces lying around anyway. So it wasn't a big amount of work, you know. Yeah. And I mean, it has earned like. I mean, it's definitely earned enough to justify doing that, but like, mm. that wasn't really the goal. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to ask you more about this kind of like interplay between your games, like how how different projects feed off one another. I, I think there's like even more to this story of like this like non-commercial games here and these commercial games there. Um, let's look at another project that precedes Mars First Logistics. Um, should have uh, oh, that was the back button. There we go. Um, uh, this is a project called Red Desert Render um, from 2019. Uh, now, I know this game is partly inspired by the AAA game uh, Red Dead Redemption. Um, as I show some video footage that you so kindly captured from the game recently, um, Ian, can you explain what is this game that we're going to be looking at here, uh, Red Desert Render? Um, so, 
<laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm as, kind of asking a lot. Here. <laughs> I guess if I'll get, I, uh, I guess I'll sort of maybe explain where it comes from to give it like mm -hmm. context. So, so me and some friends were playing Red Dead Redemption 2 online, and we ended up kind of exploring a lot of kind of the, which is a, a big AAA, um, expensive video game set in the Wild West, mm -hmm. and um, beautiful like, like landscapes and lighting and just like something that's really nice to like like be present in um and so we were playing that online together and then we were kind of started sort of exploring a bit sort of outside of the kind of main map where you know the game takes place um kind of out of where you're supposed to be in the game and and it was just like so like um amazing to me how big this area was and how you could sort of like explore the game in a way where you kind of see a bit how it was put together so you could you know there were bits where you could sort of see under the ground you could see there was a big ocean like underneath the whole game um and um yeah we just we found some just like it was just so exciting it was just like a big adventure like it was just it was just really a big adventure and it was like um yeah i kind of wanted to make something that like kind of had that feeling from those sort of out of bounds adventures in red dead redemption 2. um so it was kind of directly related to that sort of that's that's kind of where the game kind yeah. of came from um so and so the game itself is kind of this um generated infinite landscape that you can wander around and then you can kind of find little things like here yeah, i found a bonfire and if you interact with a bonfire it kind of changes the shape of your characters all these surprising things happen you can find a bathtub and you kind of do the swim animation but then you actually start flying around um, so all these kind of things that unexpected things happen that kind of let you see the game in kind of ways that feel like you're kind of breaking it or like but kind of show you like how maybe a bit how it's sort of made um, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, well, let's, uh, on that point, and let me actually just show a screenshot here. Um, so as this kind of game about exploiting glitches or almost like the materiality, like of the game itself, Red Desert Render feels like explicitly anti-commercial to me. Um, like, especially as this kind of riff on playing with and breaking this AAA game, um, do you see it in that light as well? And like, and how do you judge the scope of a project like this? Like, how do you decide when you're done with it? I don't, I don't see it as anti-commercial, really. I mean, necessarily, like, it wasn't like, it's not like a reaction to like Red Dead Redemption mm. or to anything. It's like, and it's not the commentary on like any of the, you know, practices that went into making that game or anything like that. It's, right. it's more just like about the feeling that I had sort of exploring those, those spaces. Um, so so I, I don't personally see it like that. I see. Um, what was the second part of the question? Um, so well, let me ask then a kind of in-between question to set up yeah. the second question. Um, if maybe not anti-commercial, you were never flirting with the idea of like trying to commercialize this project, though. Is that right? Like this seems somehow maybe like even no, less commercializable than some of your. Or did you see it in that way? Or? No, not not no, not directly. I mean, I, I think I did have sort of like a kind of because I did spend quite a lot of time working on this game, mm -hmm. and I think when I released it, I, was, I put it on itch, which is like a sort of you can put a price on things, or you can just sort of say have a suggested price, and mm -hmm. people pay what they want. And I suggest that it's pay what you want, but I, suggest, I said if you paid like $20 or more, then I would give you a unique build of the game mm. with like your own custom seed. So you would have your own unique landscape in. Yeah. So it was like, I don't know, like, I guess like a bit of a commercialization. Yeah. I thought it was like a, just a fun idea to try. Mm. Um, but the, I mean, for example, like a lot of the, I mean, I was sort of thinking like when I was, sort of generating the landscapes, I really want to kind of make something that kind of um, kind of takes us a bit further with the generative landscapes. Like it's, it was really fun kind of generating these landscapes and then exploring them and kind of, I don't know, you know landscapes, 
I'm sure it's the same a lot of people who are like, they kind of like have something really emotionally kind of resonant and weighty about them. It's just like you come over like around a corner and you see something new and yeah. it's like, I don't know, it's just like, um, yeah, it's something, something really kind of like emotionally resonant about them. So like to have these things that are just generated from just like code, it's just something magical about that. And I wanted to kind of explore that a bit more. So I thought I definitely had in the back of my mind, I'll probably like, maybe use this for something else later on, you know? Okay. Um, but, I, like, as far as, like, the game itself, it, like, did what I wanted it to do. Um, and I, I think it's been quite a lot of time, and, like, I put, like, a multiplayer mode in. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I guess another kind of ulterior motive for making this game was, like, all my other games I'd made in my own kind of engine and code and stuff. And... This game I made in Unity just because, like, it did things like shadow maps and, um, you know, like 3D animation and stuff, which, well, I'm sure I could, like, implement myself. It would be a lot of work, you know, to get it right. So I was like, okay, I'm going to kind of make this game and it's going to be a way to sort of, like, make something biggish in Unity to kind of just learn how it works, you know. So that was kind of like another kind of, um, yeah, kind of sub goal. <laughs> um, so maybe I won't call it non-commercial, but maybe this like almost like partly commercial or so, like it certainly doesn't have maybe the same kind of aspirations as like Mars First Logistics. Yeah. And then how do you, it sounds like maybe it's the answer is when you feel like you've gotten what you needed to get, but how do you kind of decide when to stop working on this, like when it is finished? Um, I don't know. You just know it. Like it's just like, okay, I just, I want to move on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's like, it's, I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's any like, I, I just, I wouldn't want to like work on it anymore. I don't think it would be, I'd feel like I'd be, be beating a dead horse, you know? Mm. It's like, it doesn't feel like it would be adding anything of any kind of value, you know? Yeah. You're like, artistic value, yeah. Um, you were just talking about landscape. Um, in the past, um, for example, in um, a free play talk, that you gave about this game. Um, you've cited the painter Bob Ross, um, and, and you do <laughs> kind of describe Red Desert Redder as like a landscape in a, an almost similar tradition. Um, I know it's like a, oh, yeah. where, well, well, let me ask this. I know it's a procedurally generated landscape, but do you, do you see this landscape as explicitly Australian? Like, is that like a really direct kind of influence, or is there some kind of almost like, like representation, or like is fidelity important to you in the kind of the topology or the vegetation? Or? Um. Yeah, just on the uh, Bob Ross thing, I think it was more like just like I had been watching a bunch of his like videos, and he he kind of just saw like a, 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 like you know when he's like making his landscapes and he's like, uh, we'll put a little tree here and we'll you know have he'll have a little friend over here and it's just like he's just I don't know I mean he's probably like has it all planned out but it just feels very kind of like um, that he's kind of like. Um, I mean, like, it's all kind of just like telling a little story or kind of like, and I, I guess I, I think I, 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 it kind of, I related to that because it kind of felt like that to me, writing the code, you know, or like, it's not like, I don't, I don't see where the trees are going to, I don't know, I just put in some numbers and then they appear, you know, and then I kind of tweak them a bit, but it's like, it's like, it had that kind of magic for me, like, oh, like, so, um, yeah, th that's why I kind of compared it to that. Yep. Um, the landscapes um, are not like explicitly Australian. Uh, I think, I mean, they are obviously like, influenced a bit by Australian landscapes, but I think they actually remind me, they're not supposed to be representative of anywhere really. I just kind of tweaked them until they felt like, um, I don't know, they had, a, they had the kind of, I just like tweaked them until they kind of felt like nice and varied and also kind of like nice and rugged. But I think they kind of remind me more of South African landscapes than, than yeah. Australian landscapes. Mm. I think because they, they're much more mountainous, I think like comparatively and more like kind of, um, kind of rugged looking, I feel like, I, I, feel, I think Australia kind of, to me anyway, it's like the bits I've seen are like a bit more flat and kind of South African landscapes, but 
Um, I think it kind of remind like, I don't know, I, I, like, um, just like driving, like we went on a lot of like family kind of road trips and that kind of feeling of like going through these really rugged landscapes, like going through these big mountains and coming out in these big valleys and, um, I don't know, I just wanted it to, to evoke something in me and that's like what I tweaked it to be. It's not mm. supposed to be representative of any I see. specific landscape, mm. yeah. Um, Let's finally jump back into Mars First Logistics, so we can, um, yeah, good. got a screenshot here. Now, you know, obviously one thing that jumps out in me, having played Red Desert Render before, was like how much the landscape reminds me of Red Desert Render. Um, is that intentional? Like, what's the relationship between these two projects? Is there, is there one? Uh, yeah, so the, the landscapes in this game are also generated, and they're using the same well, an evolution of the um, code that I made for Red Desert Render. Um, but it has changed quite a lot. Um, and yeah, I've tweaked it quite a lot for this game. But, um, and so, and I kind of like, I definitely wanted to do something with that, um, the tech I made for Red Desert Render, um, for those landscapes, I kind of, I kind of wanted to make I was really kind of um, mesmerized by these landscapes and I wanted to kind of make them like a, almost like a character in a, in a game or like, a, like an adversary in a game. Um, and so that's where the kind of idea for this game kind of came from. It's like, what's, a, what's an interesting way to, to kind of make the landscape like a, kind of a character in the game and sort of having to sort of transport things over this treacherous landscape? seemed like a kind of a, a good way to do that. Uh, was, there, was there like a considerable period of overlap between the two projects in terms of that? Or okay. No, no, it was like, yeah. I think I had completely finished with Red Desert mm. Render by the time I started this. Mm. Um, going back to this idea of um, like this kind of now almost like longer term project you're working on, well, what has it been like shifting to Mars first logistics. Like, are you still working on kind of side projects or, yeah, maybe talk about that shift. Um, yeah, it, um, it feels nice. Like, I don't, I don't, it's just like, I think, I think because like I'm working with um, people that I, so there's other people working on Mars first logistics um, and um, I really enjoy working with them um, and it's, it's like, it's a big project, but it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's the first time I've done like, or well, at least a commercial kind of sandboxy type game. So the process is, is a lot different from, so like a puzzle game where you're kind of designing these levels and they all have to be really tightly designed. I mean, there's design here, but it's like, it's much more about sort of just like, playing, making some toys and playing with them and seeing if they're fun to, you know, and the physics obviously gives you so much like for free. So it's kind of like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying just working on it. Mm -hmm. And like, and it's really nice to be able to just like add all these nice little details like to the game, just keep like adding them and have that kind of space and time to do that, you know? Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm really enjoying just thinking mm. about one project for now. And I, I mean, and I enjoyed making lots of little games when I did that, but it's yeah, just yeah. like, I think I'm just a different, different point yeah. in my life now, yeah. Great. Um, I noticed that you maintain, like, as I was like thinking about your work and, and prep for this session, I noticed that you maintain two websites, um, one for all your personal projects, you know, these are kind of like dozens of projects as ianmclarty.com, but also one is Shape Shop, uh, which I, is the studio identity for some of your commercial work. Um, how do you, do you like, do you feel like you juggle these two identities? Like is the brand of Shape Shop kind of partly now because you're working with collaborators or do you like, do you think about these two differently or is that just like a kind of boring logistical difference? It's just a boring logistical yeah. difference. <laughs> like, I mean, so for my first, I did like get some private funding and so it just made like sense 
commercially and from a liability point of view and from a tax point of view to make like a separate company because I've always been like a sole trader before yeah. um, and that was fine up to like what I was doing up to that point but it just it made sense to make a separate company and so I transferred the RP of like my commercial games to because hmm. I, I mean obviously if I do that and then it makes sense to put everything under that company otherwise yeah. I'm doing two sets of tax and everything so um, yeah, it's just a boring logistical reason. <laughs> it's like, um, but let me ask you this because, like, I also know because, like, I've encountered this myself in various settings. Like, you know, whether it's like a Steam page or something, you'll like only have like one box, and now you're forced to make kind of decisions where you say like Ian McClarty was the creator of this, or like Shape Shop was like you're sometimes like forced into those binary choices. Like, have you have one you, box? What do you mean? Like. Where you say who made the game? Yeah. Or the, the developer. Yeah. I or think like, I just put Shape Shop on all of them. I see. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So you, you, you feel kind of happy. I mean, I guess that makes sense if you have a team. But that, is that, has it, that, it sounds like maybe no, but has that been kind of like a conceptual or a mental shift for you, kind of from Ian McClarty to Shape Shop? Um, uh, maybe a little bit like in the sense that like, um, Like I remember, I remember watching like a Zach Gage and Bennett Foddy talk where they were like, "Put your name on the game." Can't remember that talk. Um, and so it's like this idea of like putting, like, like Bennett Foddy's getting over it with Bennett Foddy kind of thing. Like, I was like, uh, and like, I think that resonated with a lot of people at the time and kind of resonated with me. But, but like, I think I realized that like I don't really like being like in the spotlight. Mm. Like I, I just like. For me, it's like I enjoy making the games and like I enjoy the process, but I don't necessarily want to be like the, I don't know, the brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Cool. Um, uh, how do you um, how do you keep yourself motivated uh, working on like a kind of longer project? Like you mentioned, some of the games we looked at earlier maybe were even made in like a week or two. This is you know clearly a few few years now. Like, how do you decide how to scope the various features? Is that still like something that you're figuring out? Of this game? Go? Yeah, as a, as a longer project. Um, or are you just like, well, I'll just kind of, I have the luxury of I'll just c kind of keep working on this as, as... No, I think, I mean, I think I'm pretty good at scoping just from having made like a bunch of smaller games. Mm. So I've just like really practiced at it. And also like from 20 years of like software development, like I know I have a pretty good sense of like how hard something's going to be. And my games are very like, programming heavy I think because that's like what I enjoy doing so there's like a lot of I mean for example like the landscapes are all like generated by code they're not like handmade you know mm -hmm. so it's like um, and I think that just like obviously makes it easy for me to like estimate how long things are going to take so um, yeah I, th I feel like I just have a pretty good sense and, and I'm pretty like I feel like I'm very practical in the sense that, like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get in a situation where, like, it's a drag, you know, and I've got all these features that I want to implement, and it's just like, it's just really hard and it's just a lot of work. I want to keep it kind of, like, so that it's, if you know, so that it's small enough in scope that it's like still fun for me to make, you know. Um, well, I, I mean, I think this like it's still a pretty big scope game, but I, I feel like I've been. A lot of it is like thinking about like, you know, how can I do this without like, you know, how can I add this thing or whatever without sort of blowing it up in scope, kind of keeping it all like manageable. Yeah. So that's always like, I'm always thinking about that. Yeah. 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 Um, let me ask one more question and then I think we're going to open it up to the, to the audience after that. Um, one of my favorite things about your work is actually not just the work itself, but also some of your documentation around the games. Yep. Um, so like, for example, recently on Twitter, you've been um, kind of talking about highly technical uh, features, like um, some of the graphic, uh, graphics technological tricks you've developed, like your approach to edge detection and rendering lines and so forth and so on. Um, why spend so much effort on these kinds of like visual polish details? You know, the, getting the exact kind of like edge detection right looking good to you. Um, like, as an outsider, it seems to me, to tell me if I'm wrong, that these software tricks mean more to you like, than merely just like, making the game look good. 
that it's not just a means to an end, but you're kind of like reveling in this kind of like. I mean, that is, is that the right? game. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I mean, it's like as much a visual thing as it is anything else, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, like, um, I don't know. I, I like, I like definitely consider myself like self a visual artist in that sense. Like yeah. it's like, so like, um, obviously there's all these like game systems and stuff as well, but like. I think the visual like aspect of it is is really important to me. Yeah. Um, and then as far as like you know, I mean, and I, and obviously like with my programming background, it's kind of like um, kind of puts me in a not unique but like um, position where the way I'm making that those visual kind of flourishes and, and polishes is 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 with like you know technical techniques like this. Um, and yeah, I think, like, I mean, with this one in particular, like, I, I'd, I'd looked at some of the other kind of, because there are some other games that kind of do this kind of edge detection, and it's kind of, it seems like everyone does it slightly differently, so I thought, like, I've kind of, like, done it a different way, so, it might, you know, it might be worth kind of sharing that. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a bit of, like, kind of marketing in there as well, like, um, you know, I want to tell people about my game as well, and this is like a way to do that as well. So, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, like for me, this is like the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't hog the entire interview. Um, maybe we can open this up to a few questions from the audience. You said you have a, a mic that we can pass on. Okay, great. Um, do we have from the live audience any questions uh, for Ian? Yeah, please. All right, should, well, come around with the mic. Uh, I just wanted to ask, when you were working on your like multiple non-commercial games, did you often have like multiple projects on the go at once, or would you just focus on one at a time? I think just one at a time. But they didn't take very long to make, so. It often be like done in a week or a couple of weeks or something like that. So, yeah. Fair. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Good question. Um, any other questions from Ian? Uh, yeah. Why don't we start um, with Helen and then we'll uh, snake our way in the back. Yeah. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, first of all, just want to say thank you for sharing your stories with us today. Um, my question is: Do you have any kind of interests or in terms of your artistic practice kind of beyond computers and working on games that might have influenced you when you work on games? So for example, from memory, I think you also paint as well, um, or any kind of non-games type interests um, that has influenced the way you make games or vice versa. I mean, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I have interest in, in visual arts. Um, I, I haven't painted for quite a while, but I, yeah, I used to um, draw and paint. Yeah, um, I've actually been getting into Lego a bit, like, which is like kind of very related to this game. But I, I think it's kind of like an interesting kind of like, um, well, it's it's just kind of nice to do something with your hands, but it's also like quite creative um, and visual. Um, I like, um, I don't mean like really big on like, I don't mean like particularly sporty, but I do enjoy like physical things. Like I, I enjoyed like, I don't know, playing tennis with my dad or like playing soccer at school. Not like, I wasn't very good at it, but like during breaks and whatever, like, I don't know. Or like one of the, my favorite things when I was younger was like, like bouncing a ball against the wall. I don't know, repetitive kind of like, um, I, I don't know. I think that like informed like a lot of the action games that I made. Yeah, stuff like that. Um, <laughs> can we pass the mic. Continue passing it in the row behind. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. Um, I was wondering 
um, considering Red Desert Render and Namas first logistics are open world games. Um, I was wondering what you find or what do you think is the most interesting thing about open world games? And in general, or these ones in particular? Both in general and what you wish to take from those games and try implement or recreate. Um, I, I don't know, I think there's something kind of uh, adventurous and exciting about just having this really big kind of thing to explore. You could just go anywhere and, you know, have a look around. It's kind of like something exciting about that, that it's not just on rails, but you can kind of just go off and explore whenever you want, you know. Um, I think it's kind of like you don't really get the opportunity to do that in, in real life that much. I mean, even if you go hiking or something, there's normally a trail you have to follow. Or, um, so I don't know, it's just kind of exciting and adventurous. Um, I think with these games, I think one of the things that I've been able to do, I mean, even something like Red Dead Redemption 2 and these big AAA games, the actual sizes of the maps are like, compared to reality, like really small, they're like 10 miles across or whatever, and it's supposed to represent like the whole of California or something, you know? And like, um, so, but with the like generative techniques, because they're kind of generated on the fly, like kind of, like um, similar to like No Man's Sky, which is another kind of procedurally generated game. Um, you can kind of make like just really vast kind of distances that kind of can feel really lonely and kind of vast and it kind of appeals to me as well. Um, yeah, so uh, does that answer the question? I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Do we, um, do we have time for a couple more questions? Yeah, great. Um, there we go. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, please. Um, I had wanted to ask about um, as somebody who really enjoys, you know, using code for creating, I suppose, like something that is a, both an art piece but also an incredible, you know, uh, technical feat. Um, do you feel as though you personally have a intent behind your games to make them like easily reiteratable? Because I see a, kind of a trend <clears throat> between, for example. Of Solar, uh, Catacombs of Solaris and uh, Mars, as well as a lot of your games have this like endless reiteration through code. Do you feel as though this is something you look for when you're making a game? Mm, not really. I don't want. Mm, I mean, there's no there's no shared code between Catacombs and, and Mars because it, they were made in different engines, different languages. Um, but like, I mean, in, in Red Desert Render, I reused the code for the landscapes in my statistics. I think, I mean, obviously, like, because I have like a software engineering background, I tend to just naturally like think about like making my 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 code maintainable and stuff for myself. You know, I mean, um, but it's not like a big focus, you know. But yeah, um, but. Um, Nice. It's yeah, um, yeah. It's not really like a strong focus, but it like it just sort of naturally comes out of my background. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a few more minutes in case we have any other questions for Ian. Yeah, please. Can we pass the mic? Or oh, we have a second mic. Great. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about Mars First Logistics. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed all the different parts of the vehicles are very detailed, and I was wondering what you looked at for inspiration or how you designed them exactly? Um, that's a good question. So, so there's a, a kind of the way that you build the vehicles is, um, I think one of the unique things about this game, or at least I haven't seen it in like any other building game where basically each part has a little prong sticking out of it and it only has one prong and you can put that prong into one of the sockets, the little round bits. And so that was kind of why they look like that, because they're all the sockets where you can kind of connect things together. And sort of I wanted something that kind of looked kind of like a socket that you could put something into. Um, and it kind of came from that. Um, and then it kind of, yeah, I guess it sort of has like a bit of a, I didn't want it to look like it was ripping off Lego or any other kind of, of those toys. Um, at least in the kind of piece design. Um, but at the same time, I wanted it to look like it was modular, you know, so. Um, 
yeah, so it kind of just came from that, really. Thank you. Um, yeah, can we pass the mic, or one of the mics, up to the back? Yeah, great. Hey, Ian. <coughs> First off, love your socks. Um, oh, sorry. I have a bit of a boring question about, uh, I guess, the logistics of Mars First Logistics. Um, can you talk a bit about your team um, and what kind of roles they had, and a bit about the funding you got um, and how you're kind of making it all possible? Uh, I can't really talk about the funding at the moment, but like, um, I'm so I'm working with Colonica Quigley, he's doing um, 3D art and animations, he's making all the stations and props and things in the game. Um, and um, Dan Golding is doing the music, um, and then I'm working with um, uh, Fulogen, which is Mark Mitchell and Byron Scullin who are doing the sound design. Um, uh, I'm working with John Kearney who's doing, helping me with a bit of UI stuff. He actually, he, he's the one I made both Sonics with. Um, um, yeah, and I've had like help from a few other people. Um, Mickey Rubok for doing QA on in the game. Um, Bethany, my wife, designed the logo. Um, and also getting help from um, a bunch of people in terms of like marketing and kind of, you know, things like that. Um, uh, yeah. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, we have time for one more question. One more question. Uh, where, is there one or is that? Okay, last question um, here in the front in the corner, Michael. Uh, thanks for that, Ian. That was a great talk. Um, that's a really big team. That's lots of people and, and moving parts when you've like historically worked, I think, in a fairly solitary way. Um, has that affected like your experience of the work, like day to day, like your rhythms of work and that kind of thing? Have you had to like professionalize in a way that you hadn't before? Um. So it's, I mean, I think day to day, it's mostly, um, you know, Kalonika is, is doing three days a week on the game. So um, so she's the one I'm kind of communicating the most with. Um, and we're, we're friends um, from before this game. Um, so we, we get on, and we have a pretty good working relationship already. Um, so, it's just, to be honest, it's just been really fun. <laughs> it's just like, like, I mean, she's been, she's just been bringing a lot to the game beyond like the three D art and just like ideas and things. So, um, and then the other, you know, the other people I'm working with is more like, sort of, um, I mean, the sound people have sort of come on later and they've been working on it the last month or so, but I think that's a bit more. And then, you know, Dan has been working on it the last um, week or so. Well, two weeks ago now. But um, that's just smaller sort of chunks, more sort of manageable. Not like, it's not like I'm sort of running a studio with full-time employees and stuff. So it's still, and we just do things through Discord and stuff. Um, so it's still me doing most of the work on the, on the game. But like, um, yeah, I think I think it's a pretty good kind of level for me. I'm finding it pretty manageable, and I think it's like it really helps that, um, yeah, it's the people I'm working with are um, just really nice to work with. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I haven't. Uh, I'm just I'm just really enjoying it. It's not like it hasn't. Um, it's which, which is kind of surprised me. I think because I think I was like. A little bit concerned about like I, d I didn't want to become like a manager of people you know so but that hasn't happened so that's good <laughs> um great i think that's all the time we have um but thank you ian um, and thank you acne as well <laughs> <laughs>